welcome to this video in our series where we look at fertilizers. Today we will discuss phosphate fertilizers. I'm Andrew Prince from F-Curve Agri. The phosphate fertilizer family is made up of products such as MAP and DAP, SSP and TSP, quite a mouthful of abbreviations. We'll look at what these products contain in a bit more detail later on. What we can say is that they all come from phosphate rock, which is a product that is mined in various locations around the world. Phosphate rock is then reacted with an acid, usually sulfuric acid, to free up the insoluble phosphates, which is then processed into a fertilizer. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the primary phosphate product is MAP, whereas around the world, DAP is much more common. We will focus on MAP and DAP as our proxy for phosphate fertilizers in general. In this video, we're going to look at a number of aspects that are key to pricing to help you understand how the phosphate fertilizer markets work. Firstly, the global supply demand balance, as with any commodity, is key. Oversupply or undersupply has a major impact on price direction. We'll look at the production processes and the raw materials. The cost of raw materials is obviously the primary makeup of the production cost. And then we'll look at some of the major producers and the trade flows of product where it is produced in surplus to regions where it is in deficit. And then finally, we'll look at the trends that impact phosphates around the world and how those impact on prices. Just a reminder to look at our other videos which discuss nitrogen and potassium as well as our introduction to fertilizers in general and a detailed overview of the sub-Saharan fertilizer industry. We would also love to hear from you with any questions that you may have or just to get your feedback on these videos or any other topics that you'd like to hear from. As has been mentioned, the starting point for all phosphates is phosphate rock. It is a mine product that is typically reacted with an acid to free up the phosphate. The lowest analysis commodity phosphate product is SSP or single superphosphate, which has a phosphate content of around 19% P2O5. Phosphate content is typically measured in P2O5, which is the chemical analysis for the phosphate molecule. Triple superphosphate is a higher analysis single nutrient phosphate product it has a P2O5 content of 46%. Both of these products are produced directly from rock which is reacted with, with acids. SSP coming from rock reacted with sulfuric acid and TSP coming from phosphate rock reacted with phosphoric acid. Most phosphate rock is converted into phosphoric acid which is an intermediate that is then further transformed into either an industrial or food products, as well as fertilizers such as MAP and DAP. The A in MAP and DAP is ammonium, which comes from ammonia. So as we can see in the little graphic, we've got rock reacting with sulfuric acid to produce phosphoric acid, which is then reacted with ammonia to produce monoammonium or diammonium phosphate. Around 30% of phosphate is for non-fertilizer end uses, such as animal feeds, where products such as MCP and DCP are the main animal feed ingredients. And then also food additives. Uh, food grade phosphoric acid goes into products like Coca-Cola and many other uh, food ingredients. Most phosphoric acid is consumed on site. The small portion that is traded mostly ends up in India. So India is the key determiner of phos acid prices. Typically these prices are agreed on a quarterly basis between the handful of producers and the Indians. The phosphate in phosphoric acid is usually more expensive than the phosphate in MAP and DAP because of the small number of players that produce and consume phosphoric acid. So this is a trend that we believe farmers in South Africa that use liquid fertilizers should take note of because the phosphate source for liquid fertilizers is phosphoric acid. The phosphate in MAP and DAP, the dry phosphate products, is cheaper on a unit of phosphate than phosphoric acid. In terms of MAP and DAP, around 50% of the global production is traded via deep sea. South Africa's share 
in global consumption is around 0.8%, so less than 1%. And the whole of our region, the SADC region, makes up about 1% of global demand. So we're not a very significant player in the global context. As we can see from the numbers, the overall phosphate capacity utilization is around 70%. There are a number of reasons why this number looks a little low and perhaps isn't quite as significant as one may expect. These granulation plants typically make a range of different phosphate products, so not only MAP and DAP, but sometimes TSP and even NPKs. So the capacity utilization may well be higher if the demand for other products is, is higher. We'll now look at phosphate production and some of the trade flows. On this global map, I've highlighted the phosphate capacity across the major regions. The yellow circles show countries that are net importers of phosphates. Despite having some domestic phosphate capacity, they still do not meet their local demand and are therefore importers. The blue circles represent those producers who are exporters, i.e. they produce a surplus of phosphates above their local demand. As with most fertilizers, the vast majority of phosphate producers are integrated into their raw material. The big exception to this is India, which has no phosphate deposits and therefore imports all of the phosphate raw materials. They import phos rock as well as phos acid and produce the finished fertilizers in their local plants. The Indians play quite a big role in the determination of phosphate prices because of this. In the East Asian region, China has a massive phosphate production base, but the neighboring countries such as South Korea and Japan do not and are therefore reliant on imports, which makes the overall region a net importing region. The big exporters, as with many fertilizers, are the North Africans, and here we're talking about the Moroccans and the Tunisians particularly, the Russians, and the Middle East has emerged uh, in recent years as a big player in phosphates. The main Middle Eastern producers are the Jordanians, uh, Israelis, and the Saudis. There has been increasing environmental focus on phos rock and the mining thereof. For example, the USA used to have a very large phosphate industry in the South, in Louisiana and Florida, but environmental concerns around the mining of those phosphates, particularly as they are found in wetland areas, has resulted in the Environmental Protection Agency in America basically banning all new mining licenses for phosphates. So what we see happening is the existing mines are gradually being exhausted and not replaced with new mines. So America has become a significant importer of phosphates in recent years and this trend will grow. We've also seen American major fertilizer companies investing in phosphate operations elsewhere. For example, Mosaic buying a share in one of the modern projects in Saudi Arabia. Other factors to consider in the phosphate sector are concerns over heavy metals and radioactive content. Most phosphate rock deposits are sedimentary in nature and were formed over millions of years from marine life deposits. A number of markets have become very strict on heavy metals content in recent years. And this has had an impact on which producers of phosphate rock supply those markets. It's also results in the development of technologies to remove the heavy metals at source. Again, this is a flag that impacts costs and therefore prices. Here we have an example of a new project which is, has been built in Saudi Arabia. The production economics of any commodity are always a key price determinant. If the international price stays below the production cost for a producer, i.e. the producer makes a loss, then we can expect that producer to consider shutting his plant if that loss making is sustained. On the other hand, if the price of phosphates stays well above the production cost of most of the producers, then we have investment in new capacity as producers look to take advantage of the positive margins on their production. This is especially relevant in the case of phosphates, where the number of production sites is fewer than urea, for example. With the concentration of production in fewer countries, 
the balance of supply and demand or the responsiveness of the market can be limited. So we tend to see some sustained swings in pricing as a result. Looking at the Marden project in more detail, we see that this is a fully integrated site, which means it has its own ammonia and sulfuric acid production on site, as well as the, as the mining of phosphate rock at a mine in the interior of Saudi Arabia. And then at its production site, they make phosphoric acid and then the finished products such as MAP and DAP. This facility is interesting in that it has its own state-of-the-art rail network connecting the phosphate rock mine and the production site, which is at the port. And the port facility has its own storage and ship loading, as well as dedicated jetties for ships. An interesting feature of this infrastructure is that the ship loading conveyor belt is able to load a large ship faster than the ship can discharge its ballast. So in theory, they can load a ship so fast that it would sink. Looking at the project in more detail, we see that it has around 1.2 million tons of ammonia, which is a very substantial ammonia plant, 4.5 million tons of sulfuric acid, and ultimately produces 3 million tons of DAP and or MAP. The capital cost of this project was around $8 billion, which includes the rock beneficiation plant. The construction of the overall project took around five years. We can see that the cash cost of production is around $200, which is well below the current DAP price in quarter three of 2021, which is $600. We must bear in mind, of course, that the project needs a payback. So when we look at the break-even calculation, we see that the payback would be around seven years, and this project would return an IRR in excess of 20%. In this picture, we see uh, a snapshot of one of the drag lines operating at the phosphate rock mine in central Saudi Arabia. It just gives an indication of the sheer scale of this operation. This is a basic requirement to achieve low cost production. While in South Africa we have some production in the form of phoscore, you can just compare the scale of operations between a modern world scale one and that of our local producer which is around 40 years old. The world-scale plants, understandably, are a more economic source of supply in terms of cost. In this table, we have summarized the major price drivers for phosphates. As with all commodities, the factors that influence phosphate fertilizer prices can be grouped into either supply-side drivers or demand-side drivers. Some of the factors are more local in nature, and the time frame over which these factors may affect the market can also be short-term in nature or longer term. Ultimately, it is supply-demand balances that determine price, whether the supply-demand balance for a particular country or region or the global supply-demand balance. So monitoring all of these factors and assessing their impact on either supply or demand is key to understanding price trends. Around 1.3 million tonnes of new phosphate capacity are expected to be commissioned in 2021 which represents about 5% of global capacity. Projects have a very long lead time, so capacity growth is a factor that can easily be monitored. In contrast to this 5% capacity growth, IFA, which is the International Fertilizer Industry Association, projects that demand growth will be around 1% over the next few years. So just in 2021, we've got 5% in supply growth, and 1% in demand growth. A limiting factor on demand growth has been the environmental pressure and nutrient use efficiency drive that is limiting the use of phosphates. As you would expect, crop prices are also a major driver of fertilizer demand and therefore prices, as is energy on the supply side. The main cost element to mining is energy, fuel for machines, Sulfur, which is the raw material for sulfuric acid to digest the rock, is a derivative of oil refining, and therefore is sulfur prices are closely linked to, to oil prices or energy prices. And ammonia is also a derivative of, of hydrocarbons such as natural gas. So a change in energy prices impacts the cost of producing ammonia. So we can see that all of the inputs into phosphates 
are strongly linked to energy prices. As with all commodities that are, are shipped via ocean-going vessels, the cost of shipping has increased in significance in the last 18 months. To give an indication, a vessel from the Middle East, which is where the Marden plant is, is located, sailing to South Africa, has seen its cost treble from around $20 a ton in 2019 to close to $60 in late 2021. So that wraps up our overview on phosphate fertilizers. To recap the key points, the cost of production is driven by the scale of the production plant and the cost of its raw materials. Non-integrated producers are particularly vulnerable to rising transport costs. Energy costs are a significant cost driver for phosphate production, especially in the cost of mining rock. Global trade takes place to meet demand in regions that are unable to produce their own phosphates by importing product from regions with a surplus of phosphates. At F-Curve Agri, we track all of these supply and demand factors to make our assessment of prices and the direction in which they will be heading. We hope that you have enjoyed this video and we'd love to hear from you, whether you have questions for us or just wish to give us feedback. Thank you for your interest and please take a look at our other videos.